learn some more physics. All right, who's happy the paper's over? Oh, not all of you, that's good. <laughs> All right, I was going to start with some demonstrations. There's some I brought out a couple times, haven't gotten to them, but we're, we're definitely ready for them now. So we'll uh, do a few to review, and in this lecture we'll transition into light, leave sound behind for a while, and see how it specifically relates all this wave stuff to light. We've mentioned several things. Let's see. I want to start with, um, let's do this one because I ended with it. We did those boom whacker tubes. Oh, I, that's what they were called. I don't remember if I said what they were called. Hitting me on the head. And the different lengths. The wave was set up based on the physical dimensions of the tube. Size and shape. And so that determined the wavelength. The size of the tube determine the wavelength. It's the, the air that's uh, transmitting the wave, so we have the wave speed, the speed of sound and air. And those two, you calculate then the frequency. That's the frequency, the pitch we heard. If you change this and make it shorter, then the frequency went up and it became a higher pitch. Uh, some of you uh, probably remember, you know, we talk. And... Uh, it's the speed of sound and air, and the size of our vocal track determines the pitch. How many of you have ever uh, done the helium thing, where you inhale helium and then talk? Well, less of you than I figured. <laughs> and you sound like Mickey Mouse, right? Well, the, the basics there is you don't really change the physical shape of your, your vocal track, not significantly. And so, but it went and became higher, higher pitch. You hear higher frequencies. Well, that means the wave speed must be traveling faster, which it is in helium, because helium is uh, lighter and there's more interaction, so it transmits the wave more quickly. The speed of sound is faster in helium than air. So that goes up, and so did the pitch. There's more to it, but that's the gist. Well... This is an electrolarynx. It's uh, for those that uh, lose their, their um, vocal folds and they uh, can't talk. Because remember, the whoopee cushion down here is making the vibrations, the flapping, and if that's damaged, then there's nothing to filter through the vocal tract. So they use this as their vibration. This is one type. It's basically just a battery in there that controls a little speaker, which moves a diaphragm in and out, and that's this part. So instead of making the vibrations come directly from your vocal folds, they do them externally, and they put it up to their uh, stoma, and it makes it vibrate, and the stuff inside, and then it can go through your vocal tract. So the way it works is, Hello, my name is Adam Wheeler, and we are having a physics class today. And what I'm doing is this. I pretend like I'm saying everything, but I don't use my vocal folds. I just change the shape of my vocal track, and thus the wavelength of the standing wave set up and the resonant frequencies that this is trying to drive. So this just makes the vibration. And if I change the shape, You can make those uh, fricative sounds, the consonant, tss, 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 without your vocal folds, so you can get those in there. But this thing's fun. Um, let see. Sometimes if you uh, just, we talked about singing the same note. Oh. But if you change the vowel, ooh. Tell me, which of these sound like it's a higher frequency? It's kind of a trick question because I'm trying to sing the same note. Ooh, ee, ooh, ee. 
But for some of you, and I heard a few of you say it, ooh, e. Does the e sound brighter? Would you go with that? Like more treble? So my vocal folds are vibrating at the exact same frequency. That's why it's the same note. But what's getting filtered changes. And when the way you change your uh, vocal track for an E, the higher frequencies based on the E shape come out more. Those are the harmonics above the fundamental frequency. Remember our wave spring where we had one big bump? That's like the lowest fre fundamental frequency. Not the lowest fundamental, it is the fundamental. The lowest is the fundamental. <laughs> that takes the least amount of energy, the lowest frequency. But then we got harmonics above that. Some people we used to call them overtones, where we could be twice as fast with two bumps, three times with three bumps, four times with four bumps. All of those can happen. When you pluck a string, bong, you get that fundamental, and that's the note we call it. But at the same time, you usually get those higher harmonics. This is putting out all kinds of frequencies. So is the whoopee cushion, so is your vocal folds. Which ones do you filter? For an E, it's the higher ones. And so you're hearing those higher frequencies more in an E than an ooh, E, ooh. And so it sounds brighter, brassier. We, uh, musicians call that the timbre, the timbre, the timbre, the quality of the sound. But that's the higher frequencies mixed in. Uh, some other instruments that uh, do this idea. A didgeridoo. Oh, that's right, a didgeridoo. I have one in my office. Anyway, this is a jaw harp. It's a reed. It just blocks and opens the airflow in and out of your mouth. You don't use your vocal folds. You just <laughs> kind of breathe. And you play this tube. So if you change the shape by moving your tongue around a little, you can get a few little different notes. I always wanted to be in a jug band, so I do have a wash tub bass. I have a big, couple big jugs back there. But my favorite instrument is a nose flute. You may see these. You actually blow air out your nose. It's a personal instrument. It doesn't work when you have a cold. You blow it and it directs it across your mouth like this. So you blow air across your mouth. Bernoulli's principle lowers the pressure. The higher pressure in here moves the air out and blows air through your tube. Again, you change the shape. Don't use your vocal folds, just, and you can. I've let my mustache grow a little thicker and it doesn't quite seal as well. I, didn't, I never knew that. Wow, who knew? <laughs> you get the idea. So we're making uh, air in my vocal track resonate. Here's a tuning fork. You, you make it vibrate. Vibration. It's vibrating. Can you hear it? Some of you might. But I don't, I don't even hear it that well. Now I can. And so it's vibrating, but it's not moving enough air around so you guys can hear it well. It's not coupled to the air. Because remember, it needs the air to, to transmit. So just, just because something's vibrating doesn't mean we can hear it well. So often we couple it to the air with a sounding board. That's what this is. If I hit it and then stick it in here, now you can hear it louder. Why don't I just start there? It's making the box vibrate, which can push more air around. Bigger amplitude, it's louder. A speaker, if you have a big speaker, it can move more air around. So generally, bass frequencies are louder because they're moving more air around. How many of you have one of these little uh, um, rain laps? What are they called? Music box thingies. Can you hear that in the back? Well, that's kind of lame. So let's just set it on here. Let's make the whole board vibrate. Uh, 
Let's try the door. How about the brick? What do you think? That was good. It's less flexible. It's not bending as much as those two want to. So that's resonant. Well, I'm dr a driving frequency, and we're making that vibrate, and it'll start going. Let's do a tu this tuning fork. Well, this tuning fork is the same frequency. Can you hear that higher harmonic on that one? With the fundamental there. So these want to resonate the same frequency. So I'm going to put this right next to the ping pong ball. So if this one's vibrating, we'll be able to tell. Drive this one. Sound waves come out. And you can make the ball start moving. They go in there, they make it vibrate, and, and it wants to resonate at that natural frequency, so it does. And it, we drive it naturally, resonant. Here's another one. Come around front. This is an aluminum rod. Nothing special. This is rosin. Put it on my fingers just so they're dry. And if you stroke this rod, hopefully, I can, I can drive it. And it naturally wants to resonate at a certain wavelength frequency because of its size. And you can hear it. It's actually vibrating. Uh, this end is going up and down. That end's going up and down. Those are anti-nodes where it's vibrating away from the equilibrium position. This is a node. I'm forcing it to be a node, a place of no displacement because it can't move physically. And so you can picture the wave, can't you? And then this one through there and back. So you got half of a wave here, half of a wave here, you know, half the bump. So the whole length, in that case, is one wavelength. We, the speed of sound in aluminum is faster than in air because the, the particles are closer together, which allows more interactions. So it travels faster up and down here. Between those two, that determines the frequency we hear. If I hold it here, where it's trying to vibrate, it damps it out. But let's hold it there and try to uh, vibrate it. So I'm forcing a node here. Yeah, this thing has gotten gross. <laughs> the custodian was helpful and cleaned where this was setting, and it looks like there's junk all over it. Hmm, let's see if I can stretch. Higher, isn't it? I'm at the nodes. That's where it's not trying to move. Can you picture the wave? Yes, stop it. Can you picture the wave now? Yeah. It's vibrating here and at the ends. Do you see that the wavelength got shorter? So the frequency went up. That's how we design instruments, you know? Make whatever we want. What do you here? How does that sound? Rosin. It's, uh, Yeah. Like here's some amber. You can ground it to powder. Or sometimes I use it with off a of pine. Pine tar you can put into powder. Athletes will use it too. It basically keeps your hand dry so that you don't s um, slip. And you can get a good grip. And what my finger does on this is I'm trying to go and it's sticking. But if I exert enough force, it slips. But then I stick, and then I slip, stick, slip, stick, slip. And that's causing the vibration. That's what's driving this to vibrate, which then pushes air around, and we hear it. And yes, bows, this is a bass bow instead of a violin. We can, they put it on it. And forgive me, anybody that plays a bass or violin. I know I'm abusing my bow, but you know. <laughs> it's for science. 
you can do the same thing on this piece of aluminum. I'm going to drive it and it's going to stick and slip. It's going to pull it up, it's going to flex a little, and then it'll slip and bounce back. And it'll be like a mass on a spring or a pendulum. And this will start oscillating. At what frequency? One of its natural frequencies. And there'll be little standing waves that set up on here. Here's one. Didn't say it was a good instrument. <laughs> but I would like you to see those waves. Because we've done a lot of waves in, one, in a one dimension, like the wave on a spring or those rods. This one, they go in two dimensions. They go in different directions. Let's see what I get this time. And once you, once you uh, get to resonance, it's easier to drive. Keep it going. It's like pushing someone in a swing. Once you get them up there, it doesn't take much, right? Because you're putting a lot of energy in. When things resonate, they have, they're taking in a lot of that energy. So you can actually hear the frequency and see the size of the wave, can't you? It's vibrating here. Here's an anti-node at this point, and this point, and here, and here, and here, and here, 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 here. That's where it's wiggling, and it's pushing the salt into the nodes where it's not moving. And so you can picture the wave. It's up, goes through a spot, down. Comes up, down, around. And you get an idea of the size and the sound. Let's go for a different resonance. Let's see. Let's it's a little higher, they're a little closer. Let's force, let's say, let's make these two nodes. Because I'm damping it there, so they'll try not to wiggle there. It's a lower frequency, and you can see they're much longer waves. And if you change instruments, this is a different material. It's actually brass, and it's a different size and shape, so it'll have different resonant frequencies, different natural frequencies it wants to resonate at. You know, each generation, less and less people get that. <laughs> you know, it's good luck, omen, salt over the shoulder. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google it. Don't want that one. Fine, go for it. And so again, you got waves going this way and back, and you got them this way and back. And they superimpose, and in places they constructively interfere and add together, and destructively interfere. And when you drive it right, and it matches that frequency, resonance, standing wave. Yeah? So if you have like waves, you know, in a show, so is it the same rate of thought that would be happening? Uh, you can, that's a fair analogy. You can think of these as asymptotes if you were trying to graph it. Um, in, in the sense that they're, they're nodes. They're just in two dimensions. So a wave going this way, it's like this, well, not that corner. Let's just talk about this line for a moment. Just because of this line, this side's trying to vibrate, and this side's trying to vibrate, but not in the middle. So it's kind of just going like this. But it's trying to do the same thing in the other direction. And so the corners end up moving from the four waves crisscrossing. And, but then you got this little funky thing too. And so it's really hard to envision. But if this were like a big bubble you could see, it'd be coming up here on all these spots and probably down there. And not moving around that spot. So you'd kind of see a whoop, 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 whoop. The same time you're seeing the reverse over here. Whoop, whoop, and in that direction. So they're, they're uh, nodes, places of no displacement. So if you looked at the velocity, they're actually zero at that point. The metal is trying not to move at that point. Let's do another one, one more. <laughs> it, uh, your your uh, wood to your piano and the body of a violin actually look like this. They're vibrating. That's how you're coupling the air to the, the sound of the air. So we can hear it. Uh, it's Force two here and see what happens. Uh, 
I used to wonder why uh, ex fancy violins, expensive violins, cost so dang much, like the Stradivarius. Well, frankly, strings are strings. You pluck them, you change the length and the tension, and you can get the different frequencies. But what's really coupling it to the, the air is the body, the woodman, the craftsmanship. And if you use wood that was like the brick wall, it wouldn't sound very good. But if you used wood like the door, well, relatively speaking, it would sound better. And the design, because it's trying to vibrate. And if you can match these resonant frequencies up with the most common notes and chords, they'll sound better and richer. Oh yeah, there's, that's a science. Art and science coming together. We have a couple violin, several violin makers here in Salt Lake City. There's, some, there's a school even to try to understand this stuff more. And all right, this one. We're going to move the speakers. They're going to go in and out. They're in phase with each other. That means we're going to send the same frequency to both speakers and they're going to both move out and back at the same time. It's not like this. They're, they're in phase. And so you hear that frequency. It's 1,100 hertz. 1,100 hertz. That means it's going up 1,100 cycles every second. That's this. We know the speed of sound, don't we? It's about 340 meters per second in the room. And the frequency is 1,100 hertz. What is that wavelength? I don't know. I didn't pre-calculate this one. <laughs> Divide, the zero goes away. If somebody has a calculator, you can help me out, but mm, roughly a third ish, a little more. <laughs> what? 0.3? Yeah, we'll go with that. 0.3. And this was in cycles per second, meters per second, so that's meters. So you can kind of picture an 1100 hertz frequency has a wavelength. That's a third of a meter. So let's see if a meter's about like that. The wave's about that long. You can, kind of, you can picture them. That wave comes to your ear. You're not moving. You all, you all probably hear it. But if I start rotating this, see what happens, or listen to what happens. Observations? Yeah, you're hearing a change in frequency. Uh, this isn't going super fast, so it's not really Doppler effect. It's interference. Because these are so far apart, and you got a wave traveling at you, and you got this wave traveling at you. I mean, we did an animation on, on a few lectures ago up there where you're sitting and you got the two speakers and if they come to right here and they're in phase, you hear it louder. And over here though, it had to travel a little farther from that speaker than it did from this one. And so they could be out of phase by the time they reach your ear, but in phase at your ear and out of phase at your ear. And so as I move it around, you can hear that change. And it's actually, this one's a change in amplitude, which is why it's not the Doppler effect. That was a change in frequency. For some people, it's more obvious at a lower frequency, so I'll do it one more time. I'll cut it in half. Right here, I'll let you listen. Mm. There ish. You hear that kind of wah wah? So that's just it going in and out of phase at your ear, constructive and destructive interference when they superimpose at your location. Let's visualize that some more. Because this occurs with light. And we're going to do, I'll show you an example of this with light when we get to the next chapter. So here's like the wave fronts coming at. There's two, they look the same. 
if I try to get them right on top of each other, you like that? Here, we'll even try to do it the way you guys saw from front to back. Like it's coming from the front of the room towards you. Here's a speaker. Sound waves emanate. Same speed in all directions. But if you displace the two sound sources, like this, you can see the interference. Maybe this will help people more. So this one makes waves, that one makes waves. And if you're like right, let's say the align is where they're both crests are up. They're, they're constructively interfering. And it'll be louder. So here where they're both, no, right here, where they're both aligned at the same time at those points, this would be a point where it's louder, constructive interference. If you were anywhere along this line, they'd be out of phase and you'd hear a, a dead spot. It wouldn't be as loud. Louder, quieter, louder, quieter, louder, quieter. And as that distance changes between the speakers based on the wavelength that's produced, you can get more of those or less of those, depending on how they interfere. They actually do this with telescopes. You can have radio telescopes. And if you have two of them, you can use the interference pattern to get more information out and be, have a higher resolution. And astronomers do that. In our department right here, they do that. Now let's superimpose waves a different way. You've probably heard the term beats. Beats. These two have the same frequency. Yeah, that harmonic died down. They're the same pitch. You hear it. Stop that one. You hear this one. Stop that one. You don't hear either of them. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this mass and move it down. That's changing how the mass is distributed. And it's going to change its inertia and how it wants to vibrate. It's kind of like changing the length of a pendulum. That'll change the frequency this vibrates at. So now they might sound the same. Let's see. Versus. They're close. But they're slightly different frequencies. And this is how you can tell. Do you hear that wah-wah? It's not this wah-wah. It's beats because they're slightly different frequencies. So if one is this frequency and the other is this frequency, it's that difference that you hear as a wah-wah. We call that the beat frequency. And it doesn't matter who's larger. It's, it's more like an absolute value. It's that difference. So this tuning fork is actually 256 hertz. So 256 vibrations a second. This one, by changing it, I don't know, might be 270 hertz. So the wah-wah frequency you hear would be that difference. Let's uh, raise this up a little and make them closer to, what they, to each other, but they're still different. It's slower now, the beats, because that difference is, there, is smaller. They're closer together, and so the beat slows down, and the wah-wah you hear is, is slower. You can actually determine the frequency of something that way. If you can tell the beat frequency, if the wah-wah is once every second, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, what's the beat frequency? One hertz. So what's the difference between the two frequencies? One hertz. If you know this one's 256, what does this one have to be? It's not exactly the same because we still hear that wah-wah, 255 or 257. We don't know which way because it could be either for the difference. So some people use that to tune things. Let's see. Let's, let's come up a little higher. less conspicuous but can you still hear it that means I'm getting closer and closer and if you keep going 
Uh Uh-oh, it got faster. I went past it on the other side. So you can keep adjusting it until they sound this, the beat frequency goes away. Then you know they're the same frequency. That's interference. The two frequencies, because they don't have the same exact size shape of wave, the wavelength, sometimes they're in frequency, sometimes they're not. And so you get a telltale pattern that might look like this. So this is a superposition of the two frequencies. If they're slightly different, then sometimes they match up. But then they get out of phase because they're different wavelengths. And they destructively interfere. And then they get louder, and then they get quieter. And that's why you're hearing this. The beat frequency, that big wave, the wah-wah. Just the difference between them. Does that make sense? Okay. Groovy. That was some fun stuff. Applying it with the demos and reviewing. Beats was new. Just a new application of uh, interference. So we are technically now in chapter 26. We've already uh, discussed some of this. Electromagnetic waves. 26 is titled The Properties of Light. I want to show you We've talked about it before. But one of these waves looks like, or how you can visualize it. It's not exactly, but it'll help us as we go forward. I told you it was an oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field, an electromagnetic wave. That's why it's called the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, all forms of it do this. I thought I hit play. Maybe uh, my loop option went away. So you can think of the um, yellow as the electric field. And it's a wave, just like we thought. And the blue, the magnetic field. They're perpendicular to each other. But the wave propagates perpendicular to both of them. So it's propagating along the x direction. But the electric field's oscillating in the y direction and the magnetic in the z. Just look at one of those arrows. Just follow one of the arrows. See how it just goes up and down, up and down. The electric field gets stronger, more positive, more positive, then less positive, less positive, less positive, negative, more negative, more negative, more negative, less negative, less negative. It's the strength of that electric field varies at that position. Same for magnetic field. So it's just like our waves. The medium, even though this isn't a medium, doesn't doesn't trans... (laughs) The wave spring. The material in the spring isn't physically moving back and forth. It's the wave that travels. The electric and magnetic fields are just changing in, in position. This doesn't need a medium to transmit through. The electric and magnetic fields can vibrate like this in empty space. And they do. But that's what an electromagnetic wave looks like. It's a transverse wave, where sound is longitudinal. We often use the bumps, crests, and troughs to describe the sound wave, but remember, it's a pressure wave, a longitudinal wave, like this. It's just harder to draw. An electromagnetic wave is definitely transverse, like that. You can see it has a wavelength, amplitude, and that'll describe the different types of light, whether it's brighter or darker with amplitude, or higher frequency might shift into the ultraviolet range that we can't see. And if you lower the frequency, it'll be in the infrared range with longer wavelengths. You still have the same relationships of everything we've discussed. Yeah. <laughs> I forgive you. How do they figure out that it looked like this? Um, long story short, yes, scientists figured it out. They were messing with electricity, and they were me- messing with magnetism. And the part you guys haven't learned yet is the connection between them. If there's a charge that's moving, it has to be moving. So you feel a change in the electric field. 
It creates a magnetic field. You know this, how many have made an electromagnet before? When you send current through a coil, it makes a magnetic field because you're making the charges move around. And if you stick some, some ferromagnetic like iron in, in there, you can magnetize it and pick up paper clips. Well, the reverse is true too. If you have a magnetic field, like a bar magnet, and you change it, you move it around, you can cause charges to start moving. That's how we produce electricity in most of the world still today, by taking a conductor, something that allows charges to move in it, and in a magnet, and we move them relative to each other. So they sense a change, and it causes those charges to start moving. So moving charges create magnetic fields, and moving magnetic fields create electric fields, which make the charges move. Maxwell, a scientist named Maxwell, did a lot of the work on this. You might have heard of Maxwell's equations. And the relationships between electric fields, magnetic fields, and currents. When it, he came up with the speed of light through this relationship. And he, he got to that value and realized, whoa, that's the speed of light. There must be a connection between light and an electroma electromagnetism. And he put it together. That light's an electromagnetic wave like this. Then, of course, they did a lot more math and justified it. But, <laughs> but it, for him, the math kind of gave him the clue. And then they tested it. Light is a disturbance of photons. You've heard the term photon. You've probably heard, too, the, there's a particle wave duality. Is light a particle or is it a wave? And you got different camps. And historically, people thought it was a particle. That's what they call a photon often. It's like a packet of light. It hits something like a BB and interacts with it. And that can help explain a lot of our stuff. And then another stuff, wait, it's a wave. We see light interfere in superposition. So it's got to be a wave, because that's what waves do. Yeah, but, and then they have these other effects we haven't covered, that, like the photoelectric effect, which is why Albert Einstein got his Nobel Prize. He's famous for a bunch of other things, but the photoelectric effect is what he actually got. He thought he, these packets of light, these photons, would get absorbed and eject electrons. And that helps explain that. Well, we're still confused. But most scientists agree it's both. It's, kinda, it's a particle and a wave at the same time. And which way you think of it can help explain these things. We're obviously focusing on the wave side. Um, I forgot your question now. That was all background to get to it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. So this photon exists on its own. A photon is an oscillating electric and magnetic field that can propagate on its own through space. The electric field kind of drives the magnetic field, and the magnetic field kind of drives the electric field and keeps it going. The reason it works is there's conservation of energy. If one were to get bigger than the other, then energy wouldn't be conserved, and the thing would be going to speed up or slow down or go away. And, but the speed of light's a constant. And it looks like that. So for us, the main differences will be that that's what it's doing. We're just going to see how the wavelength and the frequencies vary. And, it's, uh, and thus, it's uh, travel through things. Here, let me just see that. So we already have the electromagnetic spectrum. We brought that up. Transparent materials, how it goes through things. We talked about waves traveling through things, specifically sound. Now let's look at the light. This is transparent. What does that mean? It means you can see through it. Well, that means light goes through it. Visible light. That's light of a certain wavelength and frequency. Though that range of frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum, this is totally transparent to it. It goes right through. Now it's not undisturbed. What happens is there are interactions. If you have light coming in, this photon of light of a certain frequency, it's oscillating, it has energy. Because remember, energy is transported in a wave. Well, let's say an electron on an atom absorbs some of that energy and it starts vibrating. It can be excited to a higher energy state. It has more energy. We'll think of it as like this. But eventually it'll give up that energy and go back down. So it's like the photon comes in, 
makes it wiggle, and then it gives one up. And it'll travel to another atom that'll absorb it. And then it'll give it up and create electromagnetic wave of its own. This one absorbs it, vibrates, gains the energy. It gives it up of the exact same frequency. Because it absorbed energy, energy up. Conservation of energy. So the speed of light is a constant. But it gets delayed as it goes through things. Because it takes time to get absorbed and re-emit. Absorbed and re-emit. So when you're going through glass, it, it, we say it gets slowed down. But light doesn't, it always travels the same speed between atom to atom, molecule to molecule. But each of those interactions slow it down. So the more interactions you have, there's more in glass than there is in air. We say the speed of light's slower in glass. Let me do a little table to give you an idea. Speed is speed of light and some materials. So in a vacuum, we say it's C. And by the way, what is the speed of light? It's about 300 million meters per second. 300 million meters per second. In air, um, it's about the same. It doesn't slow down that much. It's slightly, but not much. In water, it is 0.7, this is in your book, 0.75. So it's slowed down about 25% as it tries to pass through water. Glass is about down to two-thirds the speed. And one more. Diamond is pretty optically dense. Lots of interactions. So it's uh, slowed down more than half the time it would take if the diamond weren't there. So, transparent. That's what happens. Light comes in, it's absorbed, and it just passes it right on and comes out the other side. Um, now, this is not transparent to the infrared frequencies and wavelengths. They resonate with glass molecules. And so, if they resonate, a lot of energy goes into the glass. Remember if you drive something at its natural frequency? The glass molecules naturally want to resonate at infrared frequencies. So they absorb a lot of energy and they get moving. It's going to heat up too. The internal energy will increase. They get absorbed and light doesn't make it back out. So this is opaque to IR, infrared. So let's see, if you had visible light, it passes through. If you have infrared, how should I draw it? Is it longer or shorter? Waves. So I'm representing the wavelengths here. Longer, because it's a lower frequency. Boop, but it gets absorbed. Because this one resonates. Res um, reson we'll just call it resonant. <laughs> so uh, these make them vibrate, but they re-emit. It transmits through. These, they absorb it. Because that's their natural resonant frequency, those glass molecules. So it's opaque. Ultraviolet. gets absorbed with most glass also. It's resonating not with the uh, molecules, but the electrons. The electrons of, of glass atoms like to resonate, naturally resonate, naturally vibrate, thus at resonance, at ultraviolet frequencies. So it's opaque to UV, certain frequencies of it. Some get through. But. So you have transparent materials, and opaque materials, and it depends on the frequency. Another fun one is with your remote control when you get home today, that's infrared. There's an LED in there that emits infrared that we can't see, that travels to your, uh, your TV, right? And it knows what you want. It goes through air. 
It goes through glass. No, try it. See if you got a piece of glass, see if it goes through it. Most pieces of glass are opaque to infrared. A fun one, though, is take a black plastic bag, maybe a few layers. See how many layers it takes. A black plastic bag, like a trash bag, is opaque to visible, right? But it's usually transparent to infrared. So you can hold it up to your remote, and it should pass through it, at least a, a few layers. Your camera, probably on your smartphone, can see into the infrared a little bit. So you can take your remote control and aim it at your camera. You ought to see the LED light up. It turns it into the visible so we can see it. You could try that out. <laughs> uh, so these two, because they get absorbed, increase the internal energy of the glass. And eventually they will get warmer. The temperature will go up. Opaque materials. We have some materials that aren't transparent. They don't absorb everything. Like this. This is red. We see in the visible, so we'll, we'll focus on the visible right now. This is red because red light is going to your eye. It reflects red light back to your eye, and you see red. But it's absorbing everything else in the visible. The white light, we, we, we mentioned, and we'll, I'll show it to you more, is all colors, all the frequencies and wavelengths in the visible range. They come and hit this. Well, only red's being reflected back into your eye. So all the other colors are being absorbed. The dye in red pigments, this red paint, resonates with the other frequencies, blue, green, and it absorbs them. They don't come back out. It's opaque to blue and green, but it reflects red. Uh, yes, there is a chance. Uh, yeah, you could see this, and people actually do see this slightly differently. I doubt it's that extreme where I see it as red, and my mom told me that was red. You see it maybe green, but your mom said it was red, so you learned this was red. It's probably not that drastic, but there are shifts because the colors we see is all physiological. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just do that more later. But we have cones in our eyeball that are receptive to red, green, and blue frequencies. But we're each a little different. So yeah. One more analogy we have time for. This Newton's cradle that we did before. You know, energy, momentum, transferred. So just another way to think of this. This would be a transparent material to this frequency. Comes in makes this one vibrate, hits this one, hits this one, hits this one, and it comes out the other end. What comes out is not the same light as that came in. It's the same frequency, but it wasn't the same photon. So this is, this is like transparent. Pew! This would be opaque. It got absorbed. Internal vibrations. The internal energy went up. And last but not least, our happy sad balls again. This would be a reflection. Mirrors perfectly reflect all the light, visible light. So it doesn't absorb any of the frequencies. None of them resonate. So it's, and metals do that, like the silver on here. They're loosely bound, so they wiggle, they re-emit, but instead of passing it through like something transparent, it sends it back out. So this is a reflection. Light that comes in like that is absorbed and that would be opaque. So it's still just waves interacting with the material. It causes different speeds and how we see things differently. And I'll end there. Thanks.